Well, good evening, everybody. It's a privilege to be here and open the word with all of you this evening, and I'm very grateful for the opportunity to do this. Our text this evening is going to be Matthew chapter 8, verses 18 through 27. Matthew chapter 8, verses 18 through 27. But first, before we get into our text, I was asked to share a little bit more about our story, my wife's and my story, and our mission's involvement. In many ways, it started off before we ever even got to know each other. We're both from different parts of Ohio, didn't know each other, both felt a burden from the Lord towards tribal church planting specifically. We both heard of the need the tribes had around the world for the gospel. It was you could say a bit of a mind-blowing thing for both of us at different points when you realize, wait, there are people in the world who do not have access to the gospel in their own language. They don't understand the gospel. They, they can't read the gospel. They don't have somebody coming to them and talking about the gospel. And the answer is no. They don't. And there is a need. We both felt that burden. We both started heading towards the mission field, doing what we needed to to prepare to go. And during that process, about two years before getting to missionary training school, we both met each other. We met each other briefly, didn't get to know each other real, real well at that time. And then the Lord led us to New Tribes Mission at the time, which is now Ethnos, their training center specifically in Canada. Why Canada? Well, it was just closer to Ohio, where we were both from, was a big part of it. But there were some other factors as well that influenced us going there specifically. So we both ended up there. We're able to become friends first, which is a blessing. And then after quite a few months of just getting to know each other, we ended up starting dating and then got engaged while in missionary training school. We both had concluded we thought that the Lord was taking us to the mission field as singles, and we're both at peace with that, but the Lord had other plans for us. And we ended up getting married after graduating from missionary training school in the beginning of 2018. It was March 24, 2018, we got married. And then the next two years was really focusing more on getting ready to go. There are a lot of different aspects of pre preparation that need to happen to be able to go to Papua New Guinea. And about a year of it was spent in support raising, traveling around. And about, I think it was in within nine months, we made it to 26 different states. So we made some tracks. We got around. And it can be tiring, but it was also a blessing to get around to meet the saints and a whole bunch of different churches to see how the Lord is working around the country and to hear and see people's burdens for the lost in a similar way to the burden that we felt. After those two years were completed, we were able to land in Papua New Guinea beginning of 2020. Now that date may catch several years' attention. That is, of course, when COVID hits around the globe. It had been brewing for a while, but it really came on strong at that time. We were so grateful we were able to get into the country before that happened. If we had just gotten to PNG a little bit later or been trying to get in a little bit later, we probably wouldn't have been able to get in at all. And we would have been stuck here in the States, ready to go, completely prepped, not able to really get too involved with too many things here, and not able to also get to PNG. And so we're grateful we were able to get there. And not only that, but we were able to get started on our language learning before there's, there were some lockdowns that came into effect. And so we were able to get started, and even when we weren't able to move around as much during some of the COVID times, we were also able to keep studying on our own. We had done lots of different preparation things for being able to study on our own. So our Tukbisan, the national language of PNG, was able to increase. We were able to get more fluent even during that time. There were a lot of different things that the Lord had us doing and involved in in PNG. After the, the language and the culture learning, we got to do a uh, what they call bush orientation, go into a tribe that had already been reached with the gospel and live there with them for a period of time, get to be exposed to what it's like to be in a remote location, and to really get to see what it's like to see the, the goal of a church being planted in a tribe. And I have to tell you, it was so refreshing getting to listen to these believers talk about the fear and bondage that they once lived in, and now the freedom they have in Christ and the hope they have, and even laugh at themselves at times about what they used to believe. We finished up that time and moved into 
doing surveys. We needed to decide what tribe we were going to go into. We wanted to go reach a tribe, be part of that process of bringing the gospel to a tribe that had not heard the gospel in their own heart language as of yet. But we needed to decide which one to go to. And our team, another family, and a single lady was working with us had narrowed in on a couple different tribes we thought would be the best options for our team. And so we started off with the one we thought would be the most likely to work for us, and that was the Pano people. We started off with the surveys needed, going in there, traveling around, just popping on villages. Of course, it's unannounced. We couldn't exactly get on the phone and tell them we're coming. Showing up, and they would clear out a house for us, just a jungle house made out of thatched roof and bamboo. We would live in there for a time and move to the next village and do the same thing and collecting information, using the national language of Tukpis and communicate with them, even though it wasn't their heart language, to be able to understand where they receptive to us coming. Is that something they want? Would they provide the necessary help needed, such as language helpers, to help us learn their language of Pano and so on? And after multiple trips in, we concluded that there was no reason not to go there. And so we returned and told them we're coming, to which they were excited, looking forward to us coming, learning their language, and sharing the gospel with them. Other things that we had to do while there was house preparation. We need to build houses in that location. There was a lot of effort put into purchasing supplies, figuring out logistics, making house plans. And of course, during this time as well, uh, Finisterre decided to switch from one mission base to another. And at the time, there wasn't a logistics coordinator there any longer. And our team had been filling that role, and we were, my wife and I were helping out in whatever ways we could with those responsibilities and moving from one base to another, to one that we're on now in Medang, the one that the Quambleys are on now. And having them there is just such a blessing because after being there ourselves, be, being much more <laughs> intimately acquainted with the needs of having somebody in that location, of filling out that ministry there in Medang, it was an answer to prayer to hear of them being willing to fill that role. Now after all those things have been concluded, after being there in two years in country, we and the rest of our teammates were back here in the States for a time, and it was decided that the rest of our teammates would not continue on with missions. And that was hard. At that time, we weren't able to continue forward unless we had teammates. We, we looked for a while to see if we could find some other teammates quickly, if the Lord would open that door quickly for us to continue on in the Pano tribe. And when that door didn't open quickly, we concluded with the involvement of leadership, that the right thing to do would be going back to PNG, wrap things up for the sake of our team, and to go into the Pano people and let them know we couldn't come. So we returned towards the end of 2022 to Papua New Guinea. We were there for about six months. Took the time to wrap up everything that needed to be wrapped up. There was a lot of supplies for building multiple houses to deal with that, to ship things to other people that are purchasing it, to ship stuff back to the States, not only for ourselves, but some of our te previous teammates, uh, to store other things, and to go into the Pano people and let them know. To let them know that we weren't going to be able to come. That was not a trip I was looking forward to. But it was the right thing to do. They didn't know. And they wouldn't know what happened to us if we didn't return and let them know. We headed into the tribe, and, and praise the Lord, the trip went about as good as it could have gone, making around all the different villages we had before, communicating with them what had taken place, why we weren't able to come now. And overall, their response was very understanding, and it was a blessing that it went so well. And they would say things like this. We need somebody to come and tell us about what God has to say. They would say God's talk, tell us about God's talk in our own language so we can understand it before we die. And they have some understanding because they've seen tribes around them have missionaries and the change that that's brought about in the hearts and lives of people around them. And they realize they need that. 
they wanted that. And it was on some of the hardest days that both my wife and I. <laughs> it was a blessing as hard as it was. Um, it was on some of the hardest, most exhausting, difficult days that both of us simultaneously, uh, at different times, independent of each other, had moments where we concluded, no, this is the kind of ministry we want to be involved in. This is where we want to be. This is where we have a burden for. And if the Lord would bring us back, we'd be open to going back to Pano or to wherever he opens a door in Papua New Guinea to see other people reached. A little side note that was also a blessing while in Papua New Guinea this last time was getting to teach through, do a chronological teaching through to the gospel message with a village nearby, Medang, and to see the response of people there. That was truly a blessing for those people had become kind of like family to us, even though they weren't believers before. They had helped us learn the language of Tokfisin. They had helped us learn the culture. And so it was a very special time getting to do that with them. We returned to the States, and as Pastor Philip mentioned, um, we were just going to be here. We thought we were uh, going to be stateside for a while, and then it seems like the Lord is opening doors up for us to head back. There's a couple different possibilities. We still have a heart for the Pano people to be reached. There's also a possibility of working alongside the Can family in the Doe tribe. And the Lord might have something else in store. It truly is the mind of the man plans the way, but the Lord directs the steps. And that's what we're trusting he will do. So right now, we're wanting to be faithful. We're wanting to keep growing. And yes, we want to keep fresh on our Tokfisin, to let, not to let that slip. If you were to try to learn the language of Tokfis, and you find out very quickly, it's a pretty basic language. It's not very robust, and they'll use a certain word at times to describe a lot of different things. We would use much more precise words in English to describe certain things. One such word that has a very large range is Stretim. Stretim can mean a lot of different things in English. It could mean to correct, it could mean to cut, it could mean to trim, it could mean to fix something, it could mean to clean, to organize, or it could even mean to smear something. And I could probably come up with another 20 words if I stopped and really thought about it, of what all that word could mean in English. But you see, there would be something that would go along with it that would clarify what it meant. And one common word that would go along with that, and to clarify what they meant, is osem. They would say, straightim osem. And osem meant this way, correct it this way, cut it this way, fix it this way. And what was embedded in that statement was this, follow my example. Observe what I'm doing and follow the example that I'm giving you. It would be a call to follow another. And once we step into our text this evening, you will see how significant following really is in the life of a disciple of Jesus Christ. Now, commonly when we speak of missions, we reflect and review passages like Matthew 28, 18 through 20, and rightfully so. For this is where we see the command for us to go and make disciples of all nations, the very thing that missions is doing. And that is the very thing that's already been taking place at this missions conference. And it's needed, and it's essential. We could say it's our marching orders for, for fulfilling the Great Commission. And as we move towards making disciples, what exactly is it that we are asking them to do? And if we take a step farther and a little closer, to, and if we take that step a bit farther and a little closer to home, what is it that we are to do as disciples? What is our responsibility in this equation? And so we're going to stop and consider together from Scripture for a moment, what are some of the aspects of how a true disciple functions? Now, each of these aspects we're going to look at together this evening, when looked at through the lens of missions, are going to have a tendency to look more dramatic at times, but missions are not, they are no less applicable to you and to me 
and no less of a reality for all those who are disciples of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This evening, the three aspects we will look at together will all directly connect to following. Following our Lord as disciples, which includes following in obedience, as we call others to follow Christ as well. Stretimosim. It is a call to follow another's example. We will see this need to follow highlighted for us from Christ's response to his disciples, and can we say it? His would-be disciples. The dictionary definition of a disciple is a follower or student of a teacher. But I like what scripture has to say even more than that definition. You see in Luke 6.40, I believe it's going to come up on the screen for you. It says, a pupil is not above his teacher, but everyone, after he has been fully trained, will be like his teacher. Not only is he keeping in focus the reality that a student is following a teacher, he's learning from the teacher, but when everything has been learned, when that student is fully trained, he'll be like his teacher. The Apostle Paul locks onto this when you see in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, that he says, be imitators of me just as I am of Christ. The Apostle Paul, through the instruction of the Holy Spirit, recorded for us that he was following after Christ so much so that he was able to say, again, through the direction of the Holy Spirit, follow my example even as I follow Christ's. He was an imitator of Christ. As I said, our scripture is Matthew 18, sorry, 8, chapter 8, verses 18 through 27. And as you turn there, if you haven't already, I'm going to just set the stage a little bit. Where these circumstances are developing at. The circumstances are developing on the north shore of Capernaum. I'm sorry, the village of Capernaum on the north shore of the Sea of Galilee. When standing in the old city, you can easily see across the Sea of Galilee to see the water, to see the cliffs to one side. And this was believed to be Peter's hometown. And Jesus right now is just coming off of a whole list of miracles. He has healed a leper. He has healed the centurion's servant. He has healed Peter's mother-in-law. And now many demon-possessed individuals have been set free. And of course, this all facilitates crowds developing very nicely. But yet Jesus doesn't seem to be impressed. After all, his response to seeing the crowds around him is, it's time to go. And one could ask, what has changed? Why this response? After all, if we back up to chapter 5, beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, which carries all the way through chapter 7, when Jesus sees the crowds coming, he goes up on the mountain, sits down, and begins to teach. He receives them. He teaches them. And then beginning of 8 again, when it's concluding that time of teaching, when people are coming to him to be healed, he's receiving them. He's healing them over and over again. And yet now, there's a shift. When he sees the crowds around him, his response is, it's time to go. It's not simply get in the boat and push it out to the water a little bit so we can preach easier. We've seen other times, but it's to leave completely. You see, at this time, persecution had not fully developed as of yet. And so it was still the popular thing. It was still the easy thing to be a disciple of Jesus. And Jesus knows that, and he knows their hearts, as we're going to see here shortly. And he's not impressed with what he sees. So like a fan before a famous sports figure leaves the room, we have would-be disciples coming up to Jesus, proclaiming their loyalty, and Jesus has a response for each of them. And so as we come to our very first aspect this evening, which we're going to be looking at together, Number one, disciples are willing to sacrifice their comfort. 
disciples are willing to sacrifice their comfort. Read with me verses 18 through 20. It says, Now when Jesus saw a crowd around him, he gave orders to depart to the other side of the sea. Then a scribe came and said to him, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus said to him, The foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. What is Jesus doing here? This man just proclaimed his loyalty. And Jesus, you go on talking about the birds of the air and their nests and the foxes and their holes. But you see, Jesus knows this man's heart. And he is making it abundantly clear what he requires of those who would be his disciples. He requires them to follow him. He requires them to become like him. But you might be thinking, Josh, well, how do we know that Jesus is able to know hearts? Well, first of all, Jesus is also God and knows all things. But beyond that, if you look just a few verses past this location in chapter 8 into chapter 9, you see Jesus not only knowing the thoughts of individuals, but their hearts as well. And if you look further throughout the Gospels, you will see it mentioned that he not only would know the hearts and thoughts of people who followed him, but those who be his adversaries as well. So too, in this instance, he is able to know their hearts and he has a response for each. The point is, a true disciple has to be willing to sacrifice. Jesus is asking, are you willing to give up your home, your comfort, your securities, and your familiarity? In response, there's silence. This scribe just seems to go off the scenes completely. It appears as though he wasn't ready to truly follow Jesus, as the believers in Hebrews 10.34 were. You see, Hebrews 10.34 says this, For you showed sympathy to the prisoners and accepted joyfully the seizure of your property, knowing that you have for yourselves a better possession and a lasting one. They were so ready to follow the Lord, so ready to give up their comforts that they were able to joyfully receive it when it happened. Not that they were seeking after it, but when it came to pass, their hearts were able to receive it even with joy. Now you might be thinking, but, but what if I'm not faced with ever being without comfort to this degree? What if I'm not doing something like missions where this kind of reality might be a little bit more likely? Believe me, as a child of God, you will be in circumstances where your comfort is at stake for the sake of following Christ. But you don't have to take my word for it. Philippians chapter 1, verse 29 says this, For to you it has been granted, for Christ's sake, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. Now Paul is speaking to the Philippian church here, and we know also just from the context that it's to believers, very specifically. He's saying not only has it been granted to you to believe, but also to suffer. That may come to pass through any number of means. Maybe it's grades take a hit for somebody because of the sake of fallen Christ. I've heard of that happening. Maybe it's the loss of a job, a pay cut, loss of freedom, or even reputation suffering in some capacity. But it will happen. Following is essential in the life of of the believer who is a disciple of Jesus Christ. So our first aspect that Christ wants us to remember was that disciples are willing to sacrifice their comfort. But what about the second aspect? The second one is disciples are willing to be deprived of their priorities. Disciples are willing to be deprived of their priorities. Read with me verses 21 through 22 of Matthew 8. 
said another of the disciples said to him, Lord, permit me first to go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, follow me and allow the dead to bury their own dead. Once more, we find Jesus addressing the heart of this man also. And Jesus' response could raise some eyebrows, couldn't it? Follow me and allow the dead to bury their own dead. Like foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests in verse 20, this seemingly nonsensical expression of allow the dead to bury their own dead was a figure of speech. And it meant let the world take care of the things of this world. Or could we say let the spiritually dead bury their own dead. Now, we don't know exactly what was going on with this young man's father. Had he already died? Was he expecting him to die soon? Or was he wanting to wait till some day in the future, years down the road, when his father might die before he would choose to follow Christ? Nor do we know the motivation. Was it emotional? Was it him wanting to secure his inheritance? and wanting to wait to follow after Christ until that time, we're not told. But what we do know is this. We know that Christ needed to correct him. After all, that is what he did. He corrected him. And so once more, like the first man, we have another who disappears without further mention. Jesus demands we're high and the appeal of discipleship vanished. To be clear, it is not a problem to want to be at a loved one's funeral. It is a problem, however, if that event is more important to you than following Christ. Now that circumstance isn't, doesn't seem likely to come up very often. I can say that I know of missionaries who have faced that circumstance. And the shocker of all shockers was when the time I heard of multiple instances where that was true, even within the states, that that kind of thing happened. It can be a reality for you and for me. Are we ready and willing, even in those kinds of circumstances, when it comes to not being present when a loved one is passing? for the sake of following Christ. For Jesus to say, follow me, is for him to say, deny yourself and take up your cross, as Matthew 16, 24 says. Are our priorities and desires subservient to following the Lord? I've been in the place way too many times in my life where I was refusing to follow, and after all, Seldom are we as creative as when we are justifying ourselves. And yet our faithful God, through his word, through the work of his spirit, patiently brought me to my knees. Are we ready to lay aside our priorities? Following is essential. Our third aspect is this. Disciples are willing to follow in faith, even unto danger. Disciples are willing to follow in faith, even unto danger. Read with me verses 23 through 27. When he got into the boat, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great storm on the sea, so that the boat was being covered with the waves, but Jesus himself was asleep, and they came to him and woke him, saying, Save us, Lord, we are perishing. He said to them, Why are you afraid, you men of little faith? Then he got up, rebuked the winds and the sea, and it became perfectly calm. The men were amazed and said, What kind of man is this, that even the winds and the seas obey him? Now, in both Mark chapter 4 and Luke 8, which are the parallel passages to this one, there's an emphasis that Jesus and the disciples went together in the boat to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. But it's here in chapter 8 that we see in Matthew 
that it's abundantly clear that Christ is the one that initiated in verse 18, and then in verse 23 that his disciples got in the boat with him, following him to the other side. The disciples who got into the boat were the ones acting like true disciples. The true disciple follows and says to themselves, I will follow no matter what. Have you ever heard of the book, The Hiding Place? It recounts the true story about Corey Ten Boom and her family. They said, I will follow no matter what. I will do what is right, no matter what the cost. That is why during World War II, they made a hidden room and they took in and hid Jews from the Nazis. Eventually they were found out and all but one of them gave their lives for that decision. The decision that they made did not mean that they never struggled with fear, but it did mean they followed in faith even unto danger. Corey, later on in her life, the only one that survived that time in concentration camps, had another opportunity to follow her Lord in obedience. When she came face to face with one of her captors, and as hard as it was, yes, she forgave that prison guard at whose hands that she and her family suffered so much. One Referring back to Mark chapter 4, that parallel passage I referenced earlier, we see there that there were other boats that were going along with the disciples in Jesus when they started off. But then when the storm hits, there's no mention of them. And when arriving at the other side of the Sea of Galilee, once again, there's no mention of them. We're not told for sure what happened with those other boats. But since they're no longer mentioned, there is a good chance they too thought that it wasn't worth it to continue on following Jesus to the other side, despite the fact that's what they started off to do. The Sea of Galilee is about eight miles wide and 13 miles long. And of course, they were going the length of that. Capernaum is on the North Shore, and the place that is believed to be their destination is at the complete southern end, 13-mile trek on an ocean or sea that is prone to storms and a small boat. And as we see in the text, the storm did come up, and we see these true disciples fearful. Yet though they may have been fearful when facing this terrible storm, they kept going forward to the other side, and as Jesus had originally instructed them, they did eventually arrive there, but first they turned to their Lord. The problem, though, that is now happening is that they have taken their focus off of their Lord and put it on the wind and the waves that are so easily distracting them. And so it is that the disciples think they're drowning. The present tense in verse 25 of Matthew 8 states the process is already in progress. This is a flat-out cry of anguish. But what is Jesus' response to them in verse 26? He doesn't say, men of no faith. He says, men of little faith. You see, they have believed in him. They have chosen to follow him. And they have had the necessary faith to persevere on, even when others, as we have seen, may not have been willing to sacrifice their comfort and priorities to follow Christ. Yet Jesus is calling them to deepen their faith still more in the midst of the storm. Following is essential. Could we say that we see the aspiring disciple, the wannabe disciple, and the actual disciples. Do you remember Stretimosem? That call to follow another's example? During our time in PNG, towards the end of our time there, when I'd be traveling to a different area of Papua New Guinea, 
There'd be times where somebody would observe my PNG mannerisms and the words that I would speak and how I would speak them, and they would say, oh, you're from a day. Or more importantly, they were recognizing who were the people I was learning from, whose actions I was mimicking, and whose instructions I was following. The more we follow our Lord, the more we too will become recognizable as disciples of Christ. To be a disciple, you must be willing to sacrifice your comfort. To be a disciple, you must be willing to be deprived of your priorities or desires. To be a disciple, you must be willing to live by faith, even unto danger. And yes, God will call you to deepen your faith still more and more. And he is the best example. Our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, is the best example of all three of these. After all, he left the comforts of heaven to come to this earth. And even if he came to the most comfortable place possible on this earth, it still was a step down. But he didn't just come to the most comfortable place. He was born into what some call a barn and was laid in an animal trough and lived experiencing blood, sweat, and tears in this world. Tempted for 40 days in the wilderness, going without food. And as the text references, apparently periods of time in his life without even a home to call his own. He gave up his comfort to follow the will of the Father. And what about his priorities? His priorities were so in line with the Father that throughout his life, it was perfectly aligned. And we see even from the time he was 12 years old, he told his parents, didn't you know that I had to be about my father's business in the temple? Throughout his ministry, he spoke the words that the father had him speak. And even in Gethsemane, when he prayed, may this cup pass from me, he also said, but not my will but yours be done. And what about living by faith even unto danger? Not only did he do that perfectly, but he lived by faith even unto death for you and for me, for all those whom the Father will draw to himself. Following is truly significant in the life of a disciple. It starts with following in faith. It continues in obedience and mimicking his example, as Paul did. Brothers and sisters, it can be hard to follow another so thoroughly and completely, but take heart. The one we follow is the one who commands the winds and the waves to be calm, and they listen. What kind of man is this? Jesus Christ, Son of the Most High God, Emmanuel, Wonderful Counselor, Almighty God, the one through whom all things came into existence, that is the kind of man this is. We don't often have people calling us out on what kind of disciples we are <laughs> as these disciples had, via Jesus' ability to know exactly what their hearts were doing. But if we did have someone precisely calling us out on what kind of disciple we are, as Jesus was doing, what do you think be said of you? What do you think you'd be called out on? Now, as you consider that, I have one last request. This evening, take some time to pray. Ask the Lord to reveal to you what areas may exist in your life where you need to follow and deepen your faith, whether that pertains directly towards missions or something else. 
We may not have Jesus standing here in the flesh to call us out precisely as he did with these disciples we've been looking at, but we do have his word and we do have his spirit. And he has blessed us with the church. He most certainly can guide you in that process. As we continue to grow together and strive after being the disciples that we are to be, and as we strive after calling others to be disciples of Jesus Christ and teach them all that the Lord has commanded us to do. Let us pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for what you've done for us. We thank you so much for your word, your spirit, and the abundance of blessing that you've given. For you are the truly amazing God who deserves all glory and honor. And we desire to give that to you through the lives that you've blessed us with. And I pray that you would help me and you'd help all of us to reflect on your word and to reflect on these lives that you've blessed us with and how you would have us to grow and to follow in obedience to you and your word. I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much, Brother Josh. As we... Uh, are brought to consider uh, the words of our Lord and his uh, view of discipleship. I think it's always striking uh, in our modern ears. Uh, as he said, how often do we get what type of disciple are we questioned? Uh, how often do we hear uh, those types of references directed towards us? Uh, and tonight, uh, again, thank you for the grace of opening God's word and directing towards us what kind of disciple are you? Uh, are you one who uh, says all the right things? And much like the time in Matthew 8 when persecution was not yet uh, necessarily uh, coming against those who were disciples of Christ, uh, we live in very similar times here in Stewart, Florida, uh, where we're not exactly facing any great or significant cost for our profession of faith in Jesus Christ. And so I think it's significant that in that time, Jesus gave this, this basic examination to the specific men who came up to him. Uh, and as you quoted from Philippians chapter 1, verse 29, I was reminded of verse 27, where Paul says this to the church in Philippi, uh, only live in a manner worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I think that's a really great litmus test for us. Because I think, we're, as he said, our creativity and our own justification knows no limits. And I think that we're tempted to think, well, this is what I would do if it was a funeral, or this is what I would do if it was a storm, or hopefully I'll never face those things, or that. But you can take that simple statement in Philippians 127, and, and you can just ask yourself, in any setting, we know the worth of something by how much we're willing to give towards it. Right? When we hit that point where we say, no, you've established whatever that thing is worth to you. And so when it comes to the gospel in Philippians 127, Paul's statement to live in a manner which is worthy of, at whatever point the gospel becomes a no to you, whether it is a burden for P&G or some other place outside of our borders, whether it is uh, the difficulties of being ostracized for your faith, whether it is a division in your own home, whatever it may be, at the point that you say no to the gospel is the point where you've established its worth. And Lord willing, it's at that point that conviction will come that you've revealed idolatry and you'll repent and turn from it. But that's the simple understanding of what Christ himself, knowing the hearts of men, was able to give. But for us to ask, as recipients of the gospel, the question is, what is the gospel worth? Is there anything it could ask of you that exceeds its value, that exceeds its worth, that exceeds uh, what it's accomplished in your own life if it calls you uh, to suffer, to uh, be granted suffering along with belief, as Philippians 129 declares? 
And so thankful again, a reminder that that is uh, from the hearts of two who are uh, desiring to whatever the cost. Uh, they have left home and hearth, friends and family, and they have humbled themselves in a multitude of ways and said, Lord, we'll trust you. Uh, and, and, and I can attest to, uh, for many, many months of preparation for them to come, uh, there's nothing he said to you tonight that he's not weighed himself. And so thankful for that. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and dismiss us. And as I do so, I am going to ask if, if you two wouldn't mind being at the back. I'm sure some of the folks now knowing a little bit more about you uh, may have some questions or other things. And so I do want to encourage, please get to know uh, Josh and Autumn Miller. Uh, think of ways that you can pray for them as you now know more fully their burden and desire uh, specific to PNG, the people of Pano, wherever the Lord leads. Uh, but here we are send us and so that's kind of our view in that so thank you again i'm going to pray uh just a few reminders uh the books that we've spoken of uh, are in the back uh, brother ransom was unable to be here this evening uh, but if you'll see myself uh, i can i can help you with some of the books and different things schedule for the week uh specifically tomorrow night 6 p.m again q a time here uh, and then Wednesday night, 5 p.m. in the gymnasium uh, for our annual fish fry, uh, dinner on the grounds, time together, followed at 6.30 by our final missions conference service here in the sanctuary. So look forward to you all in the next upcoming days. Let me pray and we'll be dismissed. Lord, we are so thankful that you are our strength, you are our hope, as we've been reminded already prior to tonight. Lord, foxes have holes and, and birds have nests, and those who follow you may not have those, but we have your power, we have your strength, we have your peace. Uh, Lord, we are under your authority, and there's no limitations to those things. And so, Lord, we are tempted to notice and be distracted by the wind, the waves, the limitations, the uh, difficulties. But, Lord, as we've already been reminded, even in preparation for tonight's sermon, uh, Lord, you've overcome those things. You are greater than whatever we may face and that you will have your way. Uh, your name will be great in every tribe and tongue and every nation. Lord, will we be useful vessels to you? We thank you for this time in Christ's name. Amen.